Can a believer lose their salvation? Can someone who has genuinely placed their faith in Christ, been justified, regenerated, united by faith to Christ, and dwelled by the Holy Spirit, ultimately lose their salvation? Well, the question to that, or the answer to that is no, they cannot. Although some have wrongly believed throughout the history of the church, and even today, that somebody can lose their salvation. One of the key passages that those who believe that will often turn to is found in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, particularly. And so let's take some time to look at that. And we'll begin in verse 4. And I'll read to you the section under question. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. And then he gives this illustration. For the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. But then he says this, and this is a key. But, beloved, we are concerned of better things concerning you, and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. Can a believer lose their salvation? No. And he makes that clear to those to whom he is writing. And so when we understand this, that is one of the first important points. To realize that the writer of Hebrews is now addressing a group different than his readers. For one, he goes from say, the second person of saying you to the third person, speaking of this other group, a group that has separated themselves from the body of genuine believers. But he also gives this warning to those who are still associated with that body that they have to watch their heart as well and guard against the reality of unbelief. And then, of course, verse 9, as we read, makes very clear that after he gives that warning, he turns back to his original audience, and that is the readers of the book, to say, but concerning you, we are convinced of better things, things that accompany salvation. So why does he speak this way? Well, he speaks this way because the warning is real. The warning is real that it's possible to make some kind of profession of faith, to have some kind of attachment to Christ externally, and yet it not be true it not be saving. And so the warning is important for us to consider. In doing so, we have to always remember that Scripture has first made clear, and we can answer confidently, no, he's not talking about losing salvation, because God has said that part of his eternal plan is that those whom he foreknew, he will ultimately call to faith in Christ and ultimately glorify in Christ. Many passages, but one that brings all this together is Romans chapter 8, where he says, Whom God foreknew, he predestined. Whom he predestined, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. All spoken of as completed events. Because in the mind and the purpose of God, they are completed events. They are done. But then what are we to make of a passage then like Hebrews chapter 6? Well, let's consider it a bit more closely. First of all, we have to remember that he's writing to a group that is primarily and very likely exclusively Jews. These are Jews who had heard the message of Christ and had made a profession of faith in him. And yet, some had turned away as the cost for following Christ got more and more costly. They were not quite sure they wanted to go that far, and so they turned back to Judaism. And so he's writing to warn them not to do that. But interestingly, in making this warning, he's giving them a parallel with a similar situation to Old Testament Israel. And so if you go back from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 3, he says this. He says, quoting from the Old Testament, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tested, or tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. But he said he was angry with that generation because they always go astray in their hearts and they did not know his ways. 
and so he swore in his wrath, they will not enter his rest. And he says, take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you also an unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But rather, encourage one another day by day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sins. And he says this, For we have become partakers of Christ, and here's the important phrase, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm to the end. And then he again warns them, don't harden their hearts. And then he again warns them that it is very possible, even though experiencing miraculous works of God and the grace of God and many of the fruits of God's covenant. He says this, For who provoked him when they heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not those who sinned and whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And he says they did so because of unbelief. And again, he says, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come up short of it. For indeed, we have had good news to preach to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So what's the parallel? The nation of Israel, you remember the story. They were in bondage in Egypt. God displayed his power through the many plagues against Egypt. And then he ultimately displayed his power by leading his people out up to the Red Sea and ultimately through the Red Sea by splitting it and then causing it to fall back in on the Egyptians and destroying their armies. He led them by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. He led them to Mount Sinai where they saw his power displayed in thunder and lightning and the shaking ground. He fed them manna out of heaven. He opened up the rock to pour forth water to give them drink. For 40 years, these people saw, as the writer of Hebrews says, God's works. They had heard his word. They had seen his power. They had experienced blessings of the covenant. But it was for many, most, not united with faith in their hearts. He says they always go astray. And that's the parallel that the writer of Hebrews is giving to us in the same way. Those who have heard the message of Christ, those who have experienced the power of the age to come, those who have been convinced of the word of God and yet decide to turn back to an old, dead, fruitless system are in the same danger that that generation coming out of Egypt was in. As a matter of fact, he gives very similar language as to what this generation that he's speaking to had experienced. If you go back to chapter two, he says this, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Just as that old nation Israel, the Old Testament nation of Israel, had experienced the the powers of the age to come, they had tasted of the good word, they had been partakers of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the powerful works of the Holy Spirit and demonstrations of his power and provisions. Even as they had experienced all of that, they did not believe, so it is now, with those who had seen the coming of the Messiah, who had known of his death and of his resurrection who have had that gospel preached to them and experienced miracles and signs and works of the Holy Spirit, they had become partakers of all of these things. So they were also in danger of having unbelief in their heart and the deceitfulness of sin. In the case of those who have once been enlightened and have been tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted of the good word of God. Are those believers? Well, Believers certainly would agree with all of those things, and those things would certainly be true of believers. But none of those are words that definitively define a believer. No, a believer is the one who has experienced those things and actually brings forth the fruit of salvation. And that's exactly where the writer takes us. He says, in the case of those who have experienced those things, even as the nation of Israel did, and some were saved and some weren't, The difference of those who were is that they actually didn't harden their heart. They brought forth the fruit of following God. And he says, so must you. And so he says this, 
Those who have experienced those things and fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. In other words, by going back to this old system of Judaism, by rejecting this, this message that they heard of Christ, they're aligning themselves with those who have crucified Christ. And they're affirming that that was the right thing to do. And he says, you're putting him to open shame again. You're going back to the very system that put to death the Messiah. But then he says this, and he gives an illustration that Jesus himself used in the Gospels. He says, the ground that, dri off, that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. In other words, those who have experienced those things and bring forth spiritual fruit are blessed by God. But there is another group. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed and ends up being burned. Powerful warning. And the warning is this, that it's not just having experienced all of these things. It's not just being around it. It's not just being convinced of it. It is bringing forth fruit. As I said, this is the very same imagery, similar imagery, that Jesus himself used in the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. He says to these crowds and to those there, he says that those who hear the word of God, sometimes Satan immediately comes and snatches it out of their heart. And that's like seed of a sower that falls by the roadside. And then he says there's other using this picture of a sower who's throwing out seed, which is the word of God. He says there's others that were so, it was seed was sown on rocky places. And this is the man who hears the word of God and immediately he receives it with joy and says, this is a good message. This is something that I want to be a part of my life. But he has no deep root within himself. It's only temporary. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And then there's a third that hear it and give a positive response to it. But he says, this is the man where that's like seed that's sown among the thorns. He hears the word of God, but the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But then he says there's that seed that falls into a good heart, a heart prepared by the Holy Spirit, a heart that has been born regenerated, a heart that responds in faith and repentance and brings forth the fruit of perseverance and obedience to Christ. That is the the idea there. And this is the very same imagery that the writer of Hebrews is picking up on. But Jesus even says it in many other ways in passages that you're familiar with. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform many miracles? And Jesus will say, Depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. They never did the will of the Father. We use even other language. In 2 Peter chapter 2, of those who had some kind of response, but ultimately showed they were never converted. Speaking of false teachers, he says that they have, have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, they have heard the word of God. They have tasted of the good gifts. They have, they have known of the coming of the Messiah, and they gave some initial response. He says, but after that, if they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. It is better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. And then he says this, It has happened to them according to the true proverb, A dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing, wallowing in the mire. It is those who had some initial response, had some initial escape from the defilements of the world, but their heart was never converted. And so they ultimately went back to what they have been all along, which is someone enslaved to this world and their own lust. John, the Apostle John, says it this way. He says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. These warnings are throughout Scripture. They are warnings that are a mercy of God to remind us that it is possible, it is possible to have many experiences with the Christian gospel and with the faith of Jesus Christ and yet not be truly converted. But here's the encouraging thing. 
He says to his readers, but I'm convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation. And what accompanies salvation? Well, he's already said it. Those who persevere in the faith, who don't fall away, whose faith is real and though it may stumble at times and though it may fail at times, it ultimately clings to Christ and gets back up and follows him. And that leads to the second. What is the fruit? It's obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's that simple. The one who bears the fruit of clinging to Christ as our only hope and our only salvation and the one that ultimately has is the character of life, obedience to the Lord Jesus. And so this is a severe warning, not of those who can lose their salvation, but those who get close to the gospel, who experience many of the benefits of the gospel by being around the church and the work of the Holy Spirit, but never actually commit themselves to Christ. And so one of the warning is, is to say, look, you can believe with your mind and you must believe with your mind. You can believe even in the way that you have an emotional response, and we should respond from our heart emotionally. But ultimately, saving faith are those who trust Christ in repentant faith and hold on to Him and cling to Him throughout life. And that's what faith requires, that we believe, we understand that message is true to us and to respond from our heart, and then trust Him in repentance and faith. It's also a reminder that if you hear his voice today and you're not clear about your salvation, today is the day you need to respond because you don't know about tomorrow. One, whether you'll be alive or whether by your inattentiveness to the gospel and a true response, you harden your heart past a time of repentance. If you are a believer, it's going to be shown by hearing this message and it spurs you on to greater faith. It spurs you on to cling more tightly to Christ. It spurs you on to greater maturity. So can a believer lose their salvation? No. But can somebody be wrongly attached to Christ with a false profession? Yes. I pray that you examine your own heart according to the light of Scripture and that you know Him in truth. Thank you.